Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to the second day of the 2018 uh, MOSRP uh, Annual Technical Review. Today's program will end around midday with lunch and then we'll have a dinner this evening for sponsors and uh, our families if, they're, uh, if it's convenient for you, uh, very warmly welcome. So I'd like to say a word, uh, as usual, of uh, how much we appreciate the encouragement and support that we have from our sponsors, have had and do have, especially in a, a time, as we all know, there's been a serious downturn, even though there seems to be a bit of an uptick that uptick is attributed to cost reduction, yes, frugality. And in, uh, in that kind of environment, uh, many activities are um, reduced in priority, including research, because it's sort of a longer term uh, investment. And uh, so, uh, so that's for one uh, point that I am usually grateful, uh, as always, but even more so in this environment for support and encouragement. In addition to that, we have people here from our sponsor companies, some from uh, uh, who travel great distance. Again, in this environment of tremendous scrutiny and a, a cost reduction to allow people to come to a meeting is a, a tremendously uh, positive from our point of view because uh, that's, there's a, uh, every um, thought for how to reduce costs. So when you're here, that's something you're not doing somewhere else. And I'm uh, grateful for your companies allowing that and investing in us in that, in that way, not just in the funding, but your participation. Okay, with that, I, I thought to give a very quick uh, overview of where w we have been. Uh, so um, in this meeting and where we are uh, this morning, as uh, I mentioned, the uh, the program here uh, follows the seismic processing chain. And uh, please avail yourself of the memory stick. The memory stick in this has the annual report. We should have given it out at the, at the beginning of the meeting. The annual report has a report for each of these subjects, yes, in the same order of the presentations, yes. So uh, at your leisure, you can peruse and see detail discussion on every topic that's in this uh, meeting uh, within this memory stick, okay? So um, we, we uh, started the uh, meeting with an overview and uh, uh, discussion of how green steam can provide uh, uh, pre-processing opportunities. Pre-processing -proce opportunities for predicting a reference wave, predicting uh, ghosts, not uh, trying to filter, okay? So the whole idea is you want to be able to identify and separate without injuring something else, yes? That's what green steam allows, because it's, uh, it's not trying to cut a reference wave in the presence of reflection data and cutting some reflection data in the process. It's predicting each separately given the field in the normal derivative on a cable. Okay, so, and then Jing Wu had an uh, excellent presentation on uh, uh, our view of the uh, state of that activity for both uh, offshore and onshore, including non-horizontal acquisition, which is, uh, and where PVZ, for example, fits the, the, that uh, classic uh, contribution by Lassa Adminson and, and colleagues at Statoil for deghosting, how that sits as a special case uh, of uh, deghosting when you have a horizontal cable, what's going on there is in that Fourier transform, as Jim Wu said, there is an implicit or explicit assumption that you have adequate sampling to perform it, yes? So issues of sampling are under the rug, yes? If you um, apply it, uh, these green steel methods directly in X omega, you see directly sampling issues, yes? Uh, sampling issues will have uh, issues with actually <coughs> being able to deghost your data on the cable, and then Jing Wu came up with her own new uh, uh, innovative way to uh, achieve that with, with um, 
In other words, she goes, degoes the data above the cable and then does essentially a stoked shift back to the cable and has it degosted on the cable. Yes? Because it's one way. Once it's degosted, it's a one way wave. You just shift. Yes? To move it somewhere else where you'd like it to be. Okay? So that's how, in, for a non horizontal cable, you can do degosting onshore, degosting. There are uh, primitive uh, ways for trying to do um, uh, the n n uh, to topographic uh, deviation from horizontal. Those uh, static shifts, dynamic shifts, are uh, less than what Greenstein would uh, provide. And uh, within the reports showing what conventional methods are for dealing with non-horizontal, yes, versus what Greenstein does in terms of the impact on subsequent processing. That's in last year's annual report and this year's annual report, okay? Okay, so uh, that took us uh, uh, past uh, reference wave and deghosting, and then we were in the process of primaries and multiples. And then there was a talk. I, I, I thought that was a, a time to say why multiples remain an issue that need to be removed. Why do they have to be removed? So I, I like to uh, uh, just spend a second showing you the internal multiple. If you had a discontinuous medium, and I bring the source and receiver down, or as you start with a data with primaries and an internal multiple, and you bring, as Clairvaux said, Clairvaux 3, you make the experiment of source and receiver at different depths, yes? and ask them to be coincident at time equals zero. <coughs> if you have a discontinuous medium, we'll show in a second, that internal multiple, just like yesterday, the free surface, the internal multiple causes no problem, okay? And then we'll say, show why for continuous it does, okay? So the issue of multiples, the is multiples are an issue in seismic processing simply because of our inability to give a discontinuous accurate velocity model, yes? So let me show you that for the internal. If we can get one of these pens that works. I, I think that's not well known, yes? If you, you know, it's not well known that if you had a discontinuous accurate velocity, you don't need multiple removal. Okay, so let's just show that for the internal, yes? So here's one reflector, here's another reflector. Here's a source and receiver where you actually recorded uh, and so you recorded this primary, let's say, and this primary, and you recorded this internal multiple. Clear? Just let's look at those three events. You can do higher order. Let's just look at those three. And now what we're going to do is say, uh, so let's look at what happens. First of all, migration is linear. <coughs> and in particular, <coughs> in 1D normal incidence, there's no, uh, each, each uh, in normal instance, which will keep it simple, just to keep the analysis simple, the, each uh, trace, each event on that trace is, um, as it, it just, it is linear to its corresponding event at depth. Understand? In other words, this guy, when you do this, it deeper, this guy through the shift becomes this in that process. You understand? It's one event to one. It's a linear uh, procedure. And in 1D normal incidence, so the, uh, the multiple uh, becomes whatever it becomes in the, uh, um, in the process of uh, predicting a new experiment, and the primaries do as well. So here, for example, at this depth, the experiment looks like this. In other words, this primary became this primary, yes? And this primary became this primary. And that internal multiple became this internal multiple, yes? Y you follow? It, it transfers. Migration is a linear theory, yes? You sum, and in 1D, there's no offset. You just take down, yes? There's some factor on this event that linearly alters it to what that event would look like if your recording was at depth, yes? Event by event. That's what's behind this. So let's say we're, we bring the source and receiver 
right above this first reflector. Then this primary be has become this primary, yes? And this primary becomes this primary, yes? And the internal multiple becomes this. And now if I say uh, I'm, I'm looking at zero offset at time equals zero, the only event that uh, arrives at a time equal zero is the primary from the first reflector. The primary from the second reflector and the internal multiple do not arrive at time zero. Okay? That's the whole idea of Clairval 3. M bring a source and receiver t to a place, ask for small time, yes? What, what arrives at small time is uh, giving you local property. Yes, if you ask for all time, you'll get all property. Yes, the whole, you, just like your data originally. So th that shows that at this first reflector, the second primary and the internal multiple do not contribute to that image. They don't cause any harm. If they don't cause any harm, you don't have to get rid of them. Yes? So when you go to the, now look at this. Bring that source and receiver to the, uh, above the second. This is interesting. This first one, you know, goes and becomes this, and then underneath, it turns into this. If all this, that event goes through, you understand? And suddenly it's not a reflection from the top, it's a reflection from below. Yes? That event. And so, uh, that first primary in this, um, in this new experiment becomes a reflection off the, the shallower reflector from below. Th what about the second primary? The second primary is this, yes? The first primary became this, and the internal multiple is this, yes? And then when you get down to here, lo and behold, this primary is this, the primary from the first reflector is this, and the internal multiple is this. Guess what at, at small time contributes? The primary to the second reflector, yes? In other words, if you actually had the experiment at depth through a discontinuous medium, multiples are never an issue, okay? They always come in later, yes? They don't come in at time equals zero at that location. Now let's look at smooth. If you have a primary and a multiple, in a sm and you give me a sm uh, I, we give each other a smooth velocity, yes? Then what happens is you have that source and receiver going down on that smooth velocity. It's seeing this time, yes? Get smaller and smaller, you, know, you understand? As whatever this event is, it, it, it arrived at some time. When I bring the experiment down, the time get smaller and smaller until I'm at a depth that that velocity gives you t equals zero. And you say, I just located that. Nothing wrong with that. Smooth velocity, you locate a, a reflector. The problem is this guy gets treated the same way. It has no way to distinguish. It goes down with that smooth velocity, yes, for the time of that multiple, yes, and locates it where t equals zero. In other words, where it ran out of time going down on a smooth velocity. That's why this guy gives you a problem. Is it clear? So smooth velocity is the reason, uh, as we said just I thought, it's not a, a well-known phenomenon. That also points out the fact that uh, a key a problem that has been and remains in seismic processing is the inability to get an accurate discontinuous velocity, okay? That is an open, uh, question and if uh, anyone could make a serious contribution to that, practical contribution, that would have a, a huge effect, yes? First, multiples wouldn't be an issue, <laughs> yes? Any multiple, free surface, internal, you don't need to attenuate, you don't need to eliminate, they'll never be an issue, yes? That's a big deal all by itself, yes? And secondly, you would have a, a way to accurately locate your primaries, yes? So in terms of identifying issues, if someone's uh, young and interested in some 
a major challenge if you could find an accurate discontinuous velocity that would have a, a C change difference in seismic processing. Okay, so the, the, the fact that we um, uh, right now in the uh, seismic processing world, uh, the standard is that a smooth velocity means today and for the foreseeable future, multiple removal is an issue. Yes. So then you have um, the issue of, well, uh, all these uh, migration methods by whatever procedure want primaries. And you don't have all recorded primaries, and so you can get uh, an assist for primaries that you wish you had that are unrecorded by the use of multiples, using a multiple. You're not migrating a multiple. There are times a multiple which is recorded and has a sub-event of itself which is recorded and an unrecorded sub-event which is uh, a primary, then you can get an approximate image of the unrecorded primary, yes? Like everything, that procedure has issues. The number one issue, how are you going to predict a multiple? To predict a multiple, you know, it just starts off by saying, I know I have a multiple. To know you have a multiple, you have to have the sub-events, yes? If you have the sub-events, the multiple is useless, yes? I need to have a, yes? So what is done, of course, is instead of predicting the multiples, all the data is put in as though there were multiples. And then the, the events that are not, the events that are, are not multiples cause artifacts. All the pioneers, or uh, Fachi and his team, and these are, are aware of that, and they work to address them. Uh, ISS methods are not without issues, of course. We've tried to be clear. They have high demands for pre-processing. The more ambitious the ISS method is, if you go from attenuate to eliminate, it wants the pre-processing done better, yes? The more multiplicative you're doing with something, if you want to do, so let me repeat a, a major communication yesterday. If you're in the ISS internal multiple attenuation, as every major service company is, Schlumberger, CGG, TGS, yes? PGS are all selling processes with ISS uh, internal multiple attenuation. Then we suggest you look at the free surface uh, algorithm. That if you're using SRME, you could either damage a primary or not uh, well remove a multiple, and that will have a, a harmful effect. The ISS internal multiple attenuator is not going to recover from a, a free surface multiple that's not been removed or a primary that's been damaged. It has no wherewithal. It will suffer, yes? It assumes that you did a Cavallo ISS free surface algorithm uh, because if, you're, if the result of the free surface removal is the input to another step, there's a higher bar than thus. That's the end. When some step previously was the output, now becomes the input. Usually, that uh, that uh, original output became it. That became an input. You have to achieve at a high level, higher than perhaps if it was the output itself. Yes, there's a great demand. So please consider that. We're not saying what people should do. We're trying to mention uh, if you're going to spend all this money with ISS internal multiple attenuation, you might consider uh, spending the money for the ISS free surface. Uh, so one question is, we talk about isolated, we talk about uh, isolated free surface, isolated internal, you talk about uh, iso yes, you talk about uh, proximal free surface to other events, proximal internal multiple other events. Someone might wonder, do these things occur? We're finding it hard to find a, an example where they don't occur. The whole Middle East has Every primary seems to have a, an internal multiple sitting on it. Okay. It's the North Sea, a Total published a paper saying it's not a velocity problem. The, the North Sea that they were working on, this is an EAG uh, abstract, is flat as a pancake. You have no velocity analysis problem there and no imaging problem there. 
the problem there is internal multiples sitting on top of everything. Yes? Interfering. This is North Sea. Offshore Brazil, on and on. So it's not a rare thing. So if you're dealing with processing in different places around the world and you suspect the free surface multiple or internal is interfering, uh, be cautious that the adaptive step, which we use for the ISS attenuator, be cautious that that's not doing harm that you'd rather not have. That the adaptive is not damaging a primary that you uh, might end up wanting to uh, interpret. Okay, so more than I plan to say, but uh, moving on with, um, there was an ISS uh, tutorial. We'll say a few words later on today. I'm not going to say any more. Um, the basic thing there is that there is a, uh, a methodology okay, that allows the, the possibility of achieving all processing objectives directly in terms of data and if it's marine water speed. Now, we saw uh, Dr. Yang Li Zhou, Q without Q, just because it says only water speed and data, suddenly, well, that was great. That was, oh, water speed and data. All of a sudden, it said data, yes, data. We want zero frequency data. We say, oops, well, you said data, right? You know, there's data and there's data. That data is not achievable, okay? So just because it wanted data didn't mean there was going to be a practical algorithm. So as uh, Dr. Yang Li Zhou showed yesterday, there's a way of reformulating that subseries and uh, uh, to not need to be able to uh, depend on data and water speed, but with a data that's recordable, yes? That's the point, yes? So just because it re requires data doesn't mean it's trouble free. Many issues, shallow water multiple removal, <coughs> yes? Don't have the sub of it. In other words, we can go on and on with the issues within the methods that we develop and deliver, yes? When, uh, okay. So, once that ISS uh, uh, concept was uh, uh, set up, then there were different applications for multiple removal, comparing uh, Chao Ma and colleagues, uh, comparing uh, Cavallo's ISS free surface with the industry standard SRME plus adaptive. SRME plus adaptive has made a huge positive contribution to seismic processing. Many free surface multiples have come out effectively, like with everything. Th then we find situations where we need to go beyond it, yes? Uh, we were having a big celebration, ISS internal multiple attenuate. And then all of a sudden you have an internal multiple interfering and it won't be effective, yes? Of course you bring the adaptive in to fix. So that's a, uh, a toolbox. So one thing that was not mentioned by Dr. Chao Ma and Chung Fu and myself in that presentation is SRME plus adaptive is cheaper than ISS free surface. Cheaper, okay? Less expensive to compute because it doesn't have that obliquity factor. And uh, with absent of that obliquity factor, you get an X omega form, X omega, X omega. If, uh, if you put the obliquity factor, an X omega form is more complicated, m much more complicated. So the, uh, again, it's a toolbox choice. Uh, you have the option of more effectiveness if you think you have an interfering free surface and internal multiple that could be uh, damaging some primary of interest or a target primary, a reservoir primary, yes? You can spend more to, to provide, uh, allow um, more uh, also. If you have SRME plus adaptive, then all the things you didn't do right, you didn't de-ghost and so on, yes? If that's effective, that will deal with all those things. When we're uh, looking at um, ISS free surface, it needs all those prerequisites to be an eliminator, yes? It's not like, uh, oh, oh, don't worry, we're gonna fix it with adaptive. <laughs> we're, we're saying we're not, we're not, we're trying to reduce at least the reliance on that adaptive, yes? Now another thing is, we need a new adaptive criteria that was not mentioned. 
I have a candidate method for free surface. We need a, um, uh, a criteria, energy, re in other words, what's the energy um, minimization criteria? It says if you have a multiple in your data and then you don't have the multiple, when the multiple is not there, you have less energy in some measure of energy, okay, in some interval where the multiple resided. That uh, can be a very useful criteria, except as we said, you can have an interfering primary or multiple, and your, uh, after the multiple comes out, the energy goes up, yes, not down. So the whole criteria is uh, um, uh, problematic under certain circumstances. What we're proposing are other criteria. We have a property of the um, free surface algorithm, ISS free surface algorithm that derives from the algorithm. Yes, in other words, it's it's a property, an invariance of the of the algorithm itself, and that will always align. We don't have yet a similar criteria. So, if if we're saying ISS free surface uh, doesn't need adaptive, we're talking about synthetic perfect data. Okay, you give me the reference wave out, you take the ghosts out and you go to ISS free surface, yes, it is, there are more assumptions. There's finite sampling, yes? It's assuming a horizontal water bottom, that algorithm, yes? G0FS assumes uh, a free surface, which is horizontal, yes? The deghosting algorithms don't, but the free surface removal, and it isn't horizontal, and it's not minus one. So what we feel is you need an adjustment, always, some adaptive criteria, look for alternatives to energy minimization that might be better aligned with the algorithm, yes, that you're, uh, you're serving, rather than coming separately, that might or might not. So there's a, a note in a previous annual meeting with a candidate criteria for the free surface case that needs to be further developed, and we need a new one for the internal. So we, in our view, you're always going to need an adaptive step to deal with what's outside the physics. And I don't care how many equations we write down and how many subscripts and superscripts, yes? Those equations are approximate. The world is more complicated than anything we write, and we need an adjustment, an adaptive, yes? We want to make that adaptive criteria as intelligent and aligned with the physics, but it's, it is a, a channel for the out of uh, physics reality that we want to have an adjustment, yes? If you like, a wavelet to be found. Okay, so, uh, so we had uh, talks by Chao Ma and Yang Li Zhou on uh, um, the state and suggestions for um, free surface and internal multiples when they are isolated and also when they are interfering and proximal to other events. Okay, and then we moved into the world of uh, uh, inelastic or analastic and uh, examined how algorithms uh, from within this group, the ISS internal multiple attenuation and the ISS internal multiple elimination, uh, how uh, are they effective when are they effective uh, in practice? And when are we going to have to do something more? Yes? So we, we hope we made that clear. The uh, circumstances, uh, 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 Chao Ma Eyal for free surface and Yang Li Zhou Eyal for the internal. When's our current state uh, something we can have confidence in? And when is it really an open issue? Yes? For, uh, uh, for an interfering internal multiple, that's um, uh, having absorption issues above where that down reflection occurs. Okay? If you have an absorptive medium above where this reflection occurs, yes, and, and that internal multiple is interfering, if it's not interfering, that's a solved problem. You do ISS internal multiple attenuate plus adaptive and that internal multiple comes out. It's when it's interfering that you have to have a stronger predictor, yes? That is an open issue for when absorption is above. 
if the absorption is below, yes, then it's not an issue. Then the current capability is adequate. Yes? Okay, I hope you have an idea of what we have, what we still need to do. Okay, so then uh, after that we uh, had uh, Yang Li Zhou with a subseries for Q compensation uh, without a Q. That's a tremendous uh, opportunity. We are going to be focusing a significant resource on that project, Q compensation without Q. And as a spin-off from that, we will estimate Q. Yes, you can take the Q compensation ISS subseries and turn it into an identifier, <coughs> the same series. Instead of using it in data space, you go to model space. Okay, and it has. That has consequence for all amplitude analysis because all of this concern where direct, indirect amplitude analysis, we need low frequency. The, the result of that says you don't. You don't. That you can reformulate your amplitude analysis with a different free parameter and achieve zero vertical wave number, zero vertical wave number without zero frequency. Okay? We, in our ISS depth imaging, we thought to get KZ is zero, we needed omega zero. Now that's not a distraction or a negative in terms of uh, Professor Mark Meyer's consortium. We need lower frequency. You'll see why. Including uh, in the, the methods that don't need zero frequency, they still will benefit from lower frequency. Okay? So I'm trying to give a balance here. Yes? Uh, Professor Mark Meyer is not promising zero frequency data. We need alg he's promising lower frequency data. That's valuable for everything we do, including what you're about to see. Okay. Okay. So um, that ended yesterday's meeting, and today we're in the business business of primaries, and we set, made some comments about different migration methods, with an idea of this kind of thing. We wanted to have a, some kind of migration tool that could get us through, uh, bring an experiment through a uh, medium where the waves were not one way propagating. See here, this smooth, everything's one way. You know, everything's assumed to be one way. Here you got, if you want to deal with the role of primaries and multiples in migration, you need to have a migration algorithm that can deal with uh, non one way propagation. Yes? That's what that. Uh, that um, because we, we needed to help define why multiples are an issue today, yes? And, w and if under what circumstance they would not be. Okay, today we have a different interest in the same migration uh, um, project. Here we're looking at for different migration methods, what are their properties, not in terms of uh, primary multiples or is it a signal or um, uh, why do we have to remove multiples in practice? Um, so uh, since I just said that, if you use a multiple that's recorded, if you use a multiple that's recorded, yes, which is fine, that multiple itself still needs to be removed. The multiple itself, which is recorded, needs to be removed in order to image recorded primaries. Okay? So you could use the multiple to get an approximate image of an unrecorded primary. But as an event, if it's a recorded multiple, it's got to go out. Otherwise, you're going to have this. Yes? Recorded multiples must be removed because we have smooth velocity. Yes? You can use them yes, to get a handle on, on a, um, an approximate image of an unrecorded primary. But the event itself has got to go out. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, yes? What if we have methods that build actually the discontinuities? What, what if I had way? what? I you, you say that you know, we have to get rid of the multiples because we have smooth velocity. Yes. Migration velocity. What if we have methods which actually introduces discontinuities in that? So then you start to have actual layers. You start to have exactly the situation which you are talking there. Oh, if you could have an accurate discontinuous velocity, then multiples are not an issue. 
don't have to remove them. No, no type of multiple. Right. So I'm saying that there are methods which are uh, which ambitious methods, but they try to do that. Right? Well, if they were successful, yes. Right. At uh, of course, the, the little I know about that is there's a struggle at top salt, a lot of effort, right, with trying to get through top salt. That's the, or one of the rare cases that I know that people in practice actually try to use this con continuity. I'm not saying it's never, I'm saying it's for me the, the velocity analysis needed. So a lot of work is done. Okay, let me uh, go to where you're coming from, Peter. A lot of work is done to get an accurate velocity model. But then when we migrate, we lose our courage. And we smooth. Because we know if it's not right, you understand? A lot of work is done to get an accurate velocity with discontinuities. But it's rare that we actually take it through that jump. We'll smooth it. Okay, and as soon as you do that, the multiple becomes a problem. If we would not do that, yes, multiples, we can shut down all the multiple removal projects. So that's a good point. Uh, I would encourage um, uh, more, or either more courage. I would encourage more courage for our discontinuous models. I think that will come when we have a confidence that our discontinuous are not going to cause us harm. So when you get smooth, if you get so when you do discontinuous, one of the things that was shown yesterday is you get, with RTM, you get rabbit ears and all kinds of, yes, artifacts. With Stolt C3, you go through discontinuous, no rabbit ears. So, uh, if you said some project is looking to get a practical way to get discontinuous velocity, I'd say fantastic. That's a, a very important uh, uh, area to pursue. Okay, so thank you. That's, a, as usual, excellent comment. Okay, so today we're going to look at, uh, uh, we're going to quickly mention all these migration methods and then look at uh, the industry standard RTM versus uh, another of uh, Claire Bow's initial imaging principles. In other words, the, the, uh, the, the prediction of a source and receiver experiment. Okay? Let's make it clear. RTM is not predicting a source and receiver at depth. Okay? What RTM is doing, and you'll see, is they take the recorded data back. Okay? Originally it was back in depth, now it's back in time. They take the source field forward, not the source forward. The source field is generated forward, yes? And then they do time-space coincidence. That difference between Clairbau 2, which is the source field forward, and Clairbau 3, which is predict the source down, yes? Makes all the difference. Because when you bring the source and the receiver down, you have an experiment, okay? And the ability to uh, physically interpret that and extend it to curved and diffractive uh, structure is, is not matchable by uh, RTM and Clairbau 2. So, uh, yes. So, uh, we have not invented in this program, we have not invented any new imaging principle or any imaging concept. What we're looking at is those are, so how did this happen? Maybe we'll start the talk now. The, the talk that we're supposed to start. It just goes next. Thank you, Chalma. Okay. So we're going to look at Stone C3 <coughs> migration and a comparison with RTM <coughs> for different purposes, not primaries, multiples. This is assuming multiples have come out. Uh, how did this get started? It got started, we were hearing from uh, sponsors that when they, uh, they were collecting broader band data, it happens to be in the Middle East where we <coughs> heard about this, the broader band data is expensive. They were looking for the value. When they looked at the data, the, the original data were over the same area, and the broader band data, the, the data looked different, yes? The spectrum was different, yes? The shape 
of the events were different as you would expect, brought a band. The, they, they saw value in their images, yes, and the amplitude analysis, but not as much value as they had anticipated, yes? So, and they were using RTM. So what we started thinking was if the data itself sees this benefit of the broadband, is there something we're doing in the migration method itself that's not fully benefiting from the broadband data, yes? So we started to take a look. Well, we decided to investigate how different methods for structural determination and amplitude analysis treat different frequency components in the data. Okay? So there are four objectives. We came to a conclusion, we came to a conclusion in this study that all current migration methods, without exception, one way or another, in one place or another, make a high frequency approximation. So you can't make a statement like that without justifying it, so we're gonna justify it, yes? But that was a conclusion. Then, we, we produce a migration method for heterogeneous media that will not be uh, prejudiced, in other words, less effective. So the last annual meeting, uh, I believe it was last annual meeting, Jim O'Connell, a good friend, said, well, what are you going to do about absorption? You know, you're saying it'll be a, effective, you know? So what we're saying is it's not going to be more effective for high frequency than low frequency. I'm not <coughs> saying that our migration method is going to be effective at any frequency. How effective the migration is depends on how good a velocity is and acquisition, many things. I'm just saying the method itself is not going to be prejudiced, being more effective at high than low. The problem is if it's a high frequency approximation and you keep giving me more low frequency, it's not going to get full value. You need something that at least treats all frequencies equally. So as you get more low, their, their, uh, their value at the reservoir is not, uh, so um, it's not diminished or discounted by a, uh, inadvertent. So high frequency approximations, uh, nobody's immune from that. Now we're gonna, why? I, I, we are, have not addressed this about what I'm about to say. The concept of a seismic event is a high frequency approximation. The concept that you have a reflector, here's a source and receiver, and a primary arrived. That's not what arrives. And a, a local arrival, the only time something's local is if you have a source and it's homogeneous, yes? And some pristine wave leaves here, some, and then it arrives. You know, quiet, arrives and stops. As Soon as there's a reflector, that whole reflector is illuminated by wave theory, yes? And enters that receiver. So there, I'm saying no, none of us are immune from uh, so inadvertent or advertently making high frequency approximations. We will, we will be looking for multiple removal at um, get away from the idea of event, yes? Are multiples in a more general sense being removed in terms of everything that illuminated that reflector, yes? Do you understand my, my point? We're, okay. So one thing is, we're going to uh, demonstrate that this um, original uh, uh, Stolt uh, Imaging 3 is not a high frequency approximation. Uh, I mean, Clairbao 3, the uh, prediction of the experiment. Stolt extended it. We call it Stolt Clairbao 3. Uh, Clairbao 2 is the basis of RTM. RTM will show is a high frequency approximation. After we help um, uh, hopefully convince you of that, 
the question is, so what difference does it make? How does that affect resolution? We want to quantify it. So there will be um, uh, examples where we look at for uh, different bandwidths, what are the uh, uh, ability to resolve one reflector and a wedge. And my colleague, Dr. Chung Fu, will discuss the wedge. In other words, under what circumstances for RTM, for the same velocity, same bandwidth, uh, can you determine that there's a wedge versus a single reflector, yes? Uh, compared to uh, the, the uh, Claire Bow 3. And you'll see Claire Bow 3 is better able, is able to distinguish two when uh, RTM can't. That's serious, yes? Then the question is, how when you do a heterogeneous uh, medium and you uh, implement uh, Claire Bow 3, yes, the, the, to arrange that experiment, how do you assure with a numerical procedure that in your numerical procedure you have not inadvertently made a high frequency approximation? So we will show you a, pr a method that we've developed to provide control, yes, so that uh, the step sizes, the number of terms in expansions are uh, examined under a controlled circumstance before you apply that migration method uh, for either RTM or in other words for RTM which has less resolution capability you don't want the heterogeneous business to affect its resolution so how w there's a guide that we c have come up with to allow you to control that yes so that your numerics you adjust them for a certain output, yes? Okay. So uh, otherwise, uh, you can have some integral with G0, dn, or now you're going to numerically evaluate G0, dn. How do you know what your finite difference or whatever you use didn't inadvertently make a high frequency approximation? We'll show you how, okay? That was a big concern to me. No? You understand? It makes it. Okay. So th that, so the other part is that gives control. But that doesn't mean all heterogeneity is solved. Because uh, even w with that control, in other words, there's a certain output that we will know. Well, let me just say if you have a, uh, um, Let's say you have a complicated velocity model here, V of x, y, z, yes? And you want to predict a uh, Clairbaut 3 image under here, yes? And we'll see that this Clairbaut 3 image by itself, by itself, uh, if this homogeneous is just an imaging condition, is not a high frequency approximation, yes? It's equally effective at all frequency. But now I want to implement it. I want to arrange the experiment through this velocity. That's a numerical story, you know, understand? How do I know the numerical story didn't discount damage the resolution, yes? Here's how. You, have, you come up with some velocity, yes? And then you put that velocity over C0 over C1. Here's your velocity. You do, here's your velocity, and you want to apply this to the deep water Gulf of Mexico. You do a synthetic, yes? The experiment here, clear about three, it only cares about local, because it's small offset, small time. So if you predict the source and receiver above this C0 over C1, it only cares about this. This source and receiver should be the same as if this was homogeneous C0 over C1. Yes? Because it only can yes? Time zero can't have any information about this. So you adjust the step sizes, the number of terms in the Taylor series, until the output of going through this matches this, where this is analytic, because it's homogeneous, and produces the same experiment. Yes? Once you have that machine for this, you take this machine for getting through that velocity to the Gulf of Mexico, 
where you don't know this, but you know you've gone through this without damaging low frequency. Understood? That's the idea. So, does that solve this problem? No. Because you give me rapid enough variations, yes, and I might not be able to adjust step size and terms to match this. So, we anticipate we're going to be looking at Lattice Boltzmann and other more complex, yes, more methods able to deal with rapid variation, yes, here, to match what this does and then have confidence take this to the Gulf of Mexico as an example. Okay, okay so again, th this is a step. This is not solving the problem of heterogeneity and resolution, yes? It still requires a numerical capability to get to match this, yes? That might, <laughs> might guarantee will be beyond our current methods that we're using here, yes? At some, uh, understood? Okay. Okay. Let's race on. I just said this. Migration has, wave migration has two components, an imaging condition and a propagation. These are the three um, imaging conditions as we mentioned in Clebow's classic 1971 paper. This is Stoltz, uh, uh, implementation of Clairbaugh Stolt migration is Clairbaugh 3. In other words, uh, you're predicting at depth Z, 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 those two Zs, one is the, the depth of the receiver, one is the depth of the source, and you have midpoint and offset and time is zero, then you make XH zero, and you made them coincident, and XM is the coincident X position, and the Z midpoint is and you output. Why, why does Stolt go to Fourier? If you look at Fourier migration, you say, where's spherical spreading? Right? Doesn't a wave from a point in a homogeneous medium have a 1 over R? Where's the 1 over R in, in uh, Fourier migration? Where it is is the following. You, when you Fourier transform data, you have turned the actual data that's arrived into plane waves, both on the receiver side and the source side, yes? Plane waves in homogeneous media don't change their amplitude. That's the whole value. They just shift, right? If you have actual non-plane wave as your actual data is, you have to deal even in the simplest homogeneous world with spherical spreading, yes? So that's a tremendous benefit. And then, um, so this XH0, which was part of Clairbaugh 3, gave you in the F Fourier domain a sum over KH of offset wave number that, uh, and produced a number at every point in the Earth. You got zero there if there was no reflector. You got non-zero if there was a reflector at that coincident position. But you got a number. Well, in the great um, and controversial contributions of Stolt and colleagues was to relax that condition. Don't sum over KH. And that was a huge controversy uh, at Stanford when he, this is SCP volume 24, 25. You can read about that in the leading edge a year ago. They interviewed Stolt about that experience, yes? Tremendously controversial, yes? Don't. He said, keep D of KH, you're going to get angled information. Yes? And that went to uh, Clayton Stolt, Stolt Wegline, where you don't just get a number, you get a function with respect to a, uh, a normal. And that gives you, for specular, uh, the ability to do amplitude analysis. So that became migration inversion. First you locate, then you invert. That was extremely controversial. Yeah. Extremely. I, I remember going to an SCP meeting in a car with a group of people from mobile, and I said, wasn't it great what Stoll did last year? They said, don't talk. Don't talk for the rest of this travel. Good, we'll throw you out of the car. <laughs> a, they were really upset. The truth, yes, that's the truth. So, but he, he said, uh, 
relax that condition and get some KH information at the target, yes? And then he further extended it by putting in what we would call G0, V1, G0 as a model for the data. V1 being, doesn't have to be a, a reflection coefficient. It's a point scatterer, which could be reflection. Again, that was controversial. Um, it took, stole a long time to get that published in geophysics. And that entered a book we wrote in 2012. So this is Stoltz extension. That extension to point scatterer and dealing with curved and diffractive is not possible with Clairbaut 2. Okay? It's possible with Clairbaut 3. Okay? It's just not. As I said, uh, the majority of the book that uh, Bob Stolt and I uh, published in 2012 is Clairbaut 2. Yes, is forms of RTM, yes, uh, deriving benefit from uh, Sheng Zhu, okay, Yu Chang, Norm Bleistein's pioneering work, yes. So we're not adverse, to it. it's just Clairbaut 3 has other potential, yes, other promise. So this is uh, a typical RTM formula. It's interesting that uh, the RTM idea or the Clairbaut 2 idea is supposed to work on one shot record. You give me one shot record, I take the data back. For that shot, I take that source and generate its field forward and then find time-space coincidence. That's it. That's supposed to give you an image, yes? Well, for the simplest horizontal reflector, it doesn't give a consistent image. It has a lateral varying, even if the reflector is not lateral varying, you get, so what do they do? They sum over sources. Why? Why not? Just like stacking, okay? The stack, so that inconsistent image for one shot gets sort of, well, inconsistent, inconsistent, now it looks consistent, okay? There's no physics to why that summed over source, okay? It's just, it's as if, uh, We'll just add things with different problems and the problem will diminish, okay? They will be consistent. If you compare that to uh, Clairbaut 3, the bottom one there is a Fourier uh, way. There's a sum over receivers to bring the receiver down. There's a sum over sources to bring the source down. The sum over sources is not fixing anything wrong with the sum over receivers. It needs a sum over sources to get the source down. You see how different the physics is right from the beginning. That, okay? Okay, so how do you know if a uh, migration is high frequency approximation? If you have a picture like this at some part of your migration where uh, the migration due to one event, in other words, you have a source, you have a receiver. On that receiver, at some time, there's an event. If that event is, by that migration, made into candidates, okay, possibilities, like that travel time picture, you, you're making a high-frequency approximation. That picture only the, look at the line. This is a ray theory picture, yes, of possibilities. And so if, if that picture is there, it, it's not evil, it's just high frequency, okay? <laughs> you understand? We're not going to go to war over this. I'm saying it's just high frequency, okay? Okay. In fact, it looks like a smile, okay? So, if a migration has that, so here's work of Yang Lizhou. This is looking at one source, a horizontal reflector, one receiver, one trace, yes, well, I would mean one trace, one event on that trace, what does, what does different migration methods do to that one event, yes, for one reflector. So the one on the far right is Kirchhoff, yes, the one in the middle is RTM, and the one on the left is Clairbao 3, okay. So what's going on with RTM, as with Kirchhoff, 
is you're looking at candidates. You're looking uh, for this one event, for this, with this velocity, these are the possible reflection points. And now I'll take um, uh, another event that comes from that same reflector, and now these are the possibilities, and these are the possibilities. And you look for coherent addition, yes? Coherent addition. Com that's what Kirchhoff is, that's what RTM is, okay? What is, compare that to what Clairbao 3 does. Clairbao 3 says, predict a receiver and source at this position, yes? Ask for small time. And then the answer question, answer question is, did you get a non-zero value there? You got a non-zero value. You got a reflector there, right there. You didn't get. Uh, you got a non. You got a zero value there. When you put a source and receiver at time equals zero, you got zero value. You don't have a reflector there. You understand? There's no candidates. Yes or no. You see the difference? Yes. Okay. Now, the fact that there's an experiment predicted in Clairbao 3, that there's a lot of physics to that. You can, uh, that's why it's able to be generalized into specular, non-specular, and so on. Yes? Okay, these are the people who have extended um, um, Clairbao 2 beyond RTM into amplitude, and then on the bottom, Oh, how Clairbao 3 has been extended by Stolten collaborators. Okay. We said all this. Here's this. F I'm not going to take you through this. I suffered once yesterday. There's a limit to what any one of us can take. This is that result. Let's say this was top salt. Let's say that f reflector was top salt. You can image above and below, as long as you have the velocity, there's no rabbit ears. This is a Chung Fu result. To get below, you had to go through a discontinuous velocity, yes? To get the experiment below. That needs that G0 dn. Okay, let's look at some comparisons. This is a comparison for a single reflector between a, uh, well, the red is called uh, uh, conventional, and the blue is a broader band, the spectrum, yes, of the data. And then look at what uh, the uh, images, this is what the, the data would look like, yes? Now, the, the red is the conventional with less low frequency. The way uh, we've all learned to un understand this is there are side lobes, yes? And those side lobes are an indication when you have more low frequency, the side lobe diminishes, yes? The question is what happened? This is the data, not the migration, yes? Now we'll look at the migration. So this is uh, a Clairbao 3 with conventional and then with, with uh, broadband. And we're looking at the side lobes. So wh what's the big deal with the side lobes? If you look at this, oh, okay, so the side lobe reduced. So what? In uh, Dr. Chong Fu's talk that follows after this, the side lobes are going to affect for two reflectors when you can see them. Because those side lobes from each one will interfere. Yes? And it, that issue affects whether you can tell there's a layer or a reflector, yes? So here it's okay. Uh, with a broader band, the side lobe diminished by 57%, okay, from the conventional. And then with uh, RTM for the same, it diminished, the side lobe diminished by 20%, okay? Does RTM benefit from broadband data, yes, it, it benefits, Clairbao 3 benefits more. That's all we're saying, yes? The question is, what difference does it make in resolving a layer, yes? That's what my colleague, Dr. Chung Fu, is gonna speak about right now. From the images, 
for the two migrations for a reflector that has implications for uh, a layer resolving, yes? Which is two, because of the lobes are gonna affect when you can see that there are two versus you think there's one. And, and he will also speak about what we described earlier. How do we arrange for that uh, either one, either uh, RTM or uh, Clairbao 3 in a heterogeneous medium? And he'll show some examples for a heterogeneous medium. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, uh, Dr. Shanks.